I have a couple of people that DM me this week um, who were at the course last week, and they were like, Snoopy, ET. They're just it's just so simple for them to remember that. And now, and there, one guy he was he he he's been in the dentist dental industry as a salesperson in the dental industry for over thirty years, and he goes, look at all these notes. And the course was over, and I said, "Yeah." And he goes, "I haven't taken notes in years." And I said, "Oh, that, that, that's kind. Thanks, thanks for saying." He goes, "You, know, you don't understand. I, I, I haven't heard any of this stuff, you know. And I've been doing this a long time." And that was a very powerful um, compliment that he gave me, uh, and that I was telling him how to reduce risk and improve outcomes, and he just hadn't heard it before from anyone. And I think that's what the message that's the that the smile engineer brings is that we're bringing a different perspective. I'm, I'm not talking about the same thing that all the other biologically driven lecturers talk about. I'm talking about the biomechanical risks. And there's a light bulb that goes off because once they see some of the shapes of, of implantology, they see the Snoopy, the ET, and the, and the heart, they, they go, oh, I, I have cases like that. You know, I've got a case just last week. Now I know why it broke. And so it's so easy to remember these analogies that uh, I really think that over time um, that more and more people are going to gravitate to these, these simple ways of remembering it. You don't have to know the complex math behind it. You just need to know when you see that, you have potential risk and how to drive that and how to mitigate that even after you see it, how to drive that to, to, to zero. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think you had another DM as well where someone had mentioned that they had spotted a shape and uh, made a nice comment about one of the courses. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting encouraged by these comments because it, sometimes, you know, when you lecture, you're like, uh, afterwards you get some compliments and that's very kind of, you're like, but, but is it sticking? You're like, is it really, are they really getting it? Are they getting it? And so when these, when these pictures come in and they send me the pictures of the Snoopies and the ETs and they go, look, I had an ET today. And, and, and then I, I usually write back, you know, so why did they, why did they present? He goes, the screw was loose, you know? And I go, yeah, yeah. So that's great. You know? And so it's really sticking and it just makes really warms my heart because uh, we're trying to make a difference. We're trying to make it easy for people to do implants and be very predictable because if you do it right, you get the heart, the heart-shaped implant, and when you do, the likelihood of having a complication with that is really, really low. Absolutely. And and speaking of complications, uh, that was what I wanted to talk to you about today, is what complications do you run into with your implant cases? So my number one complication for, for dental implants is patient compliance. It's patient compliance. And, and you might have guessed that being, being engineer-driven. Um, I eliminate as many variables for complications that the clinician can eliminate as possible. So I'm driving this optimization problem. I'm driving every parameter that I have control over to zero. I want to make every possible solution zero. For instance, I want to use the strongest material in my implants, like grade 23 titanium. I want to make sure that I'm using that to drive that component to zero. Okay, good. So then I can rest on that. Then I move to the next component, right? What I can't control is patient compliance. And in patient compliance, there's two main things. And the number one thing is smoking, okay? So the number one thing, 100%, 100% in my practice, and I think if you talk to Craig Mish, he'll tell you the same thing. I've heard him say it from the podium multiple times. Smoking. I, it, there's no question about the failures to, failures to integrate or an implant that integrates but fails quickly with like within the first year, smoking. It, it just, it's just amazing. Um, so we have this serious, serious conversation about smoking. Okay. So that's the first one. And the second patient compliance one would be chewing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so movement. And so when I talk to my patients about dental implants, I literally put the fear of God in them on those two subject matters. You cannot smoke. You, you just can't. It just, you can't. The body does something with that smoke and it, it identifies the implant at some point in that process as a foreign body and it rejects it. Now, the interesting thing is that with smoking failures, what you see is sometimes they'll actually get past the healing phase. The implant will not be mobile. The implant will look radiographically stable. It will be stable in the mouth. You can run an ISQ test on it. It can pass. You can run a reverse torque test on it. It will pass. 
and you go, okay, I'm going to load this, and you load it, and a year or two later, it just literally is loose, and it's completely soft tissue invaginated. You, have, you, you take the implant, and you can literally back it right out of the hole. You back it right out of the hole, and you look down in there, and there's no bleeding. It's all epithelialized, just like your pierced earring. Just like a pierced earring, you know, the epithelia grows in through around the, the, the hole where your earring goes. And you go, wow, look at that. And, you, and then you find out, you know, through some more questioning, well, yeah, I tried to stop, but doc, it was really hard. And I may have smoked during the, during the healing process. And so you have these, these early failures to deintegrate. You know, they were integrated, they passed all your tests and they, they, they fail early. So smoking and mobility. Um, Mobility is a little bit easier to identify because typically what you see with mobility is early failures, failures to integrate. So you have week three, it's loose, and the patient comes back, um, and, it's, and it's, it's loose, and they just chewed on it. Um, I've gotten better over time with being a little bit more um, judicious with my patient selection. And what I mean by that is, uh, and this is not to be offensive to any, any sex, but guys are not complicit. <laughs> guys, I don't know what it is. Like, yeah, I had one, one guy came back. And the funny thing is, guys are really honest. The guy came back and he goes, yeah, I, I, I had steak last night. Like, literally, the night, the night of the implant was placed, he ate steak. And he said, yeah, I, I chewed on it. I just, I, I, I couldn't help it, you know. And, like, and, of course, it failed, you know. So, but dudes are really, you got to really pull back on, on especially if you're going to do a non-functional immediate loads with implants with with gentlemen in the anterior where you might be inclined to do a non-functional provisional to maintain the architecture of the bone and soft tissue and give them a provisional at the same time be very very careful with your patient selection especially with the men um, and some women too, so we don't want to leave the women out, but in general, the men have a tendency to be a little bit more aggressive with their chewing patterns after, after implant placement. But those two things you can't control for, can you? And so if you can't control for those, then what does that mean as a good, a good, uh, process for you to undertake is to control for everything you can control for. So get your implant in the right location get a good reputable implant in that site, make sure that it is uh, the right size, both in diameter and length. Make sure you optimize your size and, and length for the, every given location in the, in the mouth. So do all of those things so that you, um, you eliminate all the risk factors that we take on and you then can control those, but you work with the patient to control the ones that they're that they manage. Now, I, I noticed that you were mostly talking about the the chewing and, and smoking, right, as complications. Now, that's not what I usually hear from the more broad uh, implantology community. Is there a reason or are there reasons why you think that a lot of other dentists are running into more complications due to broken implants um, or, you know, implants not integrating and there wasn't smoking going on? Yeah, I, I, I do. I, I, um, I have a, a, a strong opinion on this matter, and, and that is um, when asked to speak at conferences on peri-implantitis, I um, cannot show many cases in my practice because I don't have a lot of periimplantitis in my practice. In fact, I've only had two cases and they were both inherited. And, and this is not to say that I don't have complications and it's not to say that I don't have failures. As I mentioned previously, we do have those situations. What I'm saying is, is that when, uh, when a, a good reputable implant is placed in the right location with ample bone and ample keratinized gingiva, they just don't fail. I mean, you, they just don't fail. They, they don't, uh, as long as the patient doesn't, does their part and doesn't smoke and chew. Um, they just don't. Even, even with patients that are, that are meant, that their health history is compromised, you know, these uh, vitamin D deficiencies or they have um, diabetes, uh, poor wound healing from these other ailments, I don't see, I don't see a clinically noticeable change in the success rate with those patients. So if we look at the, the broad picture, you look at all of the parameters that, that you have to control for or attempt to control for for implant success, and I think I'm up to like 73 different criteria that we've identified, huh. uh, a lot of different variables, 
the the fact is is that there are a couple that stand out above the others, and what we say here is that we know that we think that there are four. Uh, the cornerstones of implantology is what we've referred to them uh, previously and in multiple lectures. And if you get those four things right, your likelihood of success is extremely high. The problem with the industry, in my opinion, is that there's a lot of noise. And what I mean by that is in engineering, when we have noise, it's um, um, imagine you have a room filled with 30 people. And, uh, and it's like a gymnasium. And all 30 people are talking at the same time. And you're standing in the middle of the gymnasium and you're trying to hear what's going on. Well, you can't discern what they're saying because all 30 people are talking at the same time. The problem is you need to hear what the real message is. And one person in there might be giving you the real message, but you can't discern it because of the noise. Noise is too high. So what you want to do is you want to reduce the noise. So if you got a microphone and you said, okay, everybody, everybody quiet, quiet down, quiet down quiet down, except for Bill over there. Bill, I need you to keep talking, but everyone else get quiet. Well, now if they get quiet enough, you can hear, you can hear Bill and Bill's message is coming through loud and clear. So that's noise to signal ratio that we do in engineering, right? Well, in implantology, we have the same problem. And what I mean by that is you'll have a very reputable clinician up on the podium saying all of the cases are blue. And the, the very next guy that gets up after is just as well known is just as well respected and they go, all the cases are red. And as a new clinician or even an experienced clinician, you walk away going, what in the world is going on? I mean, I like both of those guys. They're both really well known, well, world renowned clinicians. And one said it was blue and one said it was red. How can that even be? And we get confused because of the noise. So in, in our perspective, if we reduce the noise, there are four cornerstones of implantology for success. And the number one, the number one thing is location. If your implant is in good quality bone, in the right location to support the, the, the forces that it's going to incur after it heals, that's the most important thing. And if you don't get that right, let me tell you, it's just downhill from there. It's just downhill from there because what's going to happen is if the implant's not in the right spot, you're going to have off-axis loads. And off-axis loads will try to bend your implant. And if you try to bend an implant that's not designed to be bent, it will break. It might not break right away, but it will break later. Or you'll have complications like screw loosening, prosthetic, prosthetic breakage, abutment breakage, all kinds of problems, problems we don't want to see. And those kinds of problems can lead into the dreaded periimplantitis. So you can have mechanical complications that can lead to biological complications. So you want to be careful of those, okay? The second thing is what you put in that hole matters. So when you put that implant in the hole, if you're using something that's not sterile, that is not made with uh, high levels of quality, so it has impurities in it, that doesn't have the proper geometry, macro and micro geometry, it doesn't, it's not made out of the same strong grade 23 medical grade titanium. If you're not using all of those things to your advantage, you're putting something that's compromised in the hole to start with. You're starting out the race behind the eight ball. I mean, it's just... That's a really bad analogy, but that's what I'm trying to say. You're, you're starting off behind, right? You're not giving yourself every advantage to win. The second, the, the third thing is that you want to go guided. And why guided? Because guided facilitates number one, which is location. It's just a tool. So if you use a guide, you can get your implant within a few hundred microns of accuracy every single time. And that's paramount to the first cornerstone, which is location. So that's the only thing we got to say about guides. We don't want to get religious about it. You can print your own guides for dollars now. So there's no barrier like we had maybe a, a decade ago where we had extremely expensive five, six, seven hundred dollars for a surgical guide was was a steep was a steep bill to pay, right? We don't have that barrier anymore. And the software is so easy. It takes me and my team less than two to three minutes to design, completely design the surgical guide. It wow. is so quick. Yeah, it is so quick. We do it in-house. Now, we don't print in-house. We have a lab right above our office, so we just print upstairs because they have the labs and they maintain it. So it's easier for us, right? But that, that, that's a couple minutes that anyone, and I don't do it, my team members do it. So anyone in your office can be trained to do it, and it's super simple, so you can save on that. And then the fourth cornerstone is timing. It's when you place an implant. And so for in the aesthetic zone, we like to go for immediate implant placement at the time of, of extraction. 
The reason we do this is so that we can maintain the soft tissue architecture. That's why we do it. We don't want to lose it. It's not, it's, it's, and to be very clear, it's not that you can't get that soft tissue back. You can, but you have to go through a grooming process that can be timely and costly. Things that I don't want in my practice. I don't want to spend more time on a case and I don't want to spend more money on a case. So if you go with, a, if you go with an immediate implant placement into an extraction socket, and you graft the socket, you graft the gap, gap grafting is what we call it, and then you put a non-functional provisional on there to hold the soft tissue, you, you'll be done in a couple of minutes. The whole process, even for a complicated case, might be 15 minutes to do it. They walk out with a beautiful solution. They're hardly bleeding at all. That's supporting the soft tissue. They're going to heal great. And if you do all of those four things, you'll just have an amazing practice. I mean, your implant practice will thrive and you'll have virtually no periimplantitis. Now, understand when I say right location means that you have to do a digital workup ahead of time. You, you can't go to the mouth and look anatomically like we used to do. We used to, we used to, we didn't have the technology in the past, so we used to do an anatomical approach, which means that you would flap the the area, you would visualize the bone and you'd place the implant in the bone. What we're saying about this is that you're doing a prosthodontic driven protocol. So you're saying, this is where my tooth is going to be. This is where I want my tooth to be. This is how the loads are going to be applied to the tooth. Therefore, this is the size and location of my implant. And you virtually place that. Then after that, you look at the bone. It's at that moment is the first time you look at the bone and you look at the bone and say, am I surrounded by ample amounts of bone and quality? And if you are, it's a slam dunk. If you're not, that's your, that's your determining factor for bone grafting. That's when you decide I need to bone graft. You don't look at a ridge and say, it looks like you've lost a lot of bone, Mrs. Smith. So we're going to bone graft and then let it heal and then come back and do a workup. That's just backwards. That's the way we used to do it when we didn't have the technology. But if you have the technology and you look ahead of time and you ensure that you have all these parameters in place, you will have an amazing, amazing implant practice with virtually no periimplantitis or perimucositis. Why isn't everyone doing it this way? I think uh, the answer to why everyone's not doing it this way is because of the noise. There are still clinicians that haven't, that haven't uh, seen some of the content that we're presenting that don't understand these four cornerstones. And as we continue to speak and we continue to lecture and we have people that are advocates for the method, uh, which we call the IMS method, the implants made simple method, as we get more and more people on board with this concept, all of these other noisy kind of conversations start to fade away. You know, uh, all of these conversations about the depth of the implant, for instance, there are different people that have different implants for different regions of the mouth and different depths. And we don't have any of that. So we have one implant that's used everywhere in the mouth. It's same implant designs used everywhere. It's good everywhere. After all, bone is bone, is bone, is bone. It's bone, okay? So you might have different qualities of bone, D1 through D4. You might have different volumes of bone. And so you, you can have that, but it's bone at the end of the day. And so the implant that I use goes everywhere. Okay, so I don't, I don't create complexities in my life in terms of I have to have different implants for different solutions, and I have to have different uh, order inventory for those different implants, which, by the way, everybody knows is a pain in the rump because it, just keeping up with one implant system is uh, challenging enough, but have multiple implants for different types of solutions is a nightmare. Uh, I just can't even imagine you'd have to have almost a full-time person just to manage your, your, your inventory, and nobody, nobody wants that or needs that. So um, the, the problem is that, that that noise is just everywhere. And so people are running around doing these things that, 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 that reputable people are recommending because that's what they've always done, but it doesn't mean that it's been optimized. And so what we did a number of years ago is we looked at the parameters surrounding dental implant success, and we ran an optimization problem we said, which of these parameters are going to give us the best bang for our buck? Which ones that, if we implement these things, if we, if, for instance, if we only implemented one thing, if we could control for one parameter and be totally in control of that one parameter, God came down themselves and said, you have control over this one thing, what would it be? 
And in you know, would it be single stage versus two stage? Would it be pure titanium versus a titanium alloy? Would it be a deep Morse taper versus a shallow conical seal? Internal hex versus an external hex? It, it just goes on and on and on. We all know these coffee table conversations that we all kind of disagree over, right? And you've got reputable people on both sides of these camps, both of them disagreeing. And so that's the noise that just, it's just infiltrated everywhere. And what we have to do is we have to reduce the noise we have to bring it down so we can hear the solutions. And the solutions are, the, in my opinion, the four cornerstones. If you get those four things right, you'll just, you'll just have so much success and you don't need to mess with all of those other little things that are sidetracking you. The way Coyce talks about it is he says that it's um, sway. It's sway. You're being swayed by uh, your colleagues. You're being swayed off the path. You know, and so we don't want to be swayed, which I call it noise. There's a lot of noise out there that's making us make decisions that we think are in our best, the, our best interest and our patient's best interest, but maybe aren't. So checking out uh, the, the the cornerstones in more detail would be a good way to prevent that from continuing to be propagated. Well, let's hope that uh, that starts to change in the very near future and the truth gets out to a wider audience. I hope so. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer, out.